I don't want to break the new microphone. Good morning. Keep your Bibles open to Mark. It's already read this verse. We don't really deal with leprosy that much today in this country. I did find out that you can get leprosy if you touch and play with armadillos. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. But back in Jesus' day, leprosy was a dreaded disease. And if you contracted it, you were an outcast. You had to leave your family. You had to leave your town. And you had to go with other lepers. And if you came close to somebody who didn't have leprosy, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean, and they got out of your way. Human contact was diminished. Human touch, says from other lepers. It was pretty much a death sentence between you and your family. You would not see them. They may come and they may bring you food and you can talk to them from a distance. But think about this. No more hugs. No more touch. No more being close. So when this leper came to Jesus, do you think this was the driving thought in his head that this man can make me clean? Do you think that there was something that really, really pushed him forward into wanting to have a meeting with Jesus? So I want you to think about this, because I want you to see how Jesus reacted to him. Because back in that day, when somebody came to you and had leprosy, you got out of their way. And they had to say, like I said, unclean, unclean, and you moved. Did you have your hand up? I was going to say another thing. They were not allowed to go to the sanctuary anymore. That's right. They were thrown out of the, the temple. Think about that. Their life revolved, and their relationship with God revolved around being able to have access to the temple. So Jesus is walking, and let's go back to Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and 41. The reason why I picked the Gospel of Mark is what I did is I took my concordance and I looked up the word compassion. Because I just got done reading the Gospel of Mark, uh, or the Gospel of Matthew, and I just finished the Gospel of Mark. I love Mark because Mark's just bam, bam, bam. It's Jesus on the move. And what you find is if you are a person that has a hectic life, then you can relate to Jesus' life. Because when you read the Gospel of Mark, the man had no downtime. And when he tried to get downtime, there was always not just one or two, but multitudes that followed him wherever he went. And what I love about the Gospel of Mark is every two to three chapters, you read this phrase that Jesus had compassion the title of this message today is Fall in Love with Jesus. Amen. So let's look at how Jesus dealt with the leper. Verse 40 says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him. What does that word implore mean? Pleading. Pleading and begging. Because the leper understood his only hope was in this man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now what I want you to understand is you and I are that leper. Amen. And when we are in our sin, and we have no hope, and we feel the weight and the burden of that sin, there is one, there is one, brothers and sisters, who will have compassion. A leper came to him, employing him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are what? Willing. If you are willing. You can make me clean. The leper understood. The leper didn't like his situation and didn't want to die in that situation. I know what it's like to be that leper. I know what it's like to be in this body of sin. And I know that without Christ, I would die in that sin. And I cry out like the leper cry out, and I implore Jesus Christ, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
you know what the answer is? The same answer that he gave to the leper. I am willing. Jesus Christ, this walk of faith, this is why it's called a walk of faith. It is the greatest thing, but also the hardest thing you will ever do in your life. Because we are told to believe in something that we can't see. Put our trust in something that sometimes feels so far away. But the Bible tells us that God is near to each and every one of us. But it takes faith and it takes belief to understand that. And to receive the blessings that he promises us. Now listen, the leper got to see him. The leper realized that this was my only hope and the leper implored him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And look at what Jesus said to him. Verse 41, then Jesus, don't you love that next word? Moved. And then the next word, and then the next word, Jesus moved with compassion. Patty, when you saw that ugly cat, <laughs> were you moved with compassion? Not at first. Not at first, right? But something changed, right? Because now you're talking about it and you want to take them to the vets. Because something moved on your heart. Listen, brothers and sisters. This is why you have to know Jesus Christ personally. This is why you have to have a relationship with Him that is just as real as a relationship with your mother and your father, your best friend. It's got to be real because this is the foundation of what God wants to do for us, in us, and with us. Last week, we looked at the new covenant built on better promises and what God wants to do for his people who are living in the last days. That the gospel is moving all over the earth. And Jesus said that when this gospel is preached to all nations, then what? The end will come. How much farther does it got to go? So God wants a people who will be his people and allow him to be their God. And he wants to do something special and unique for us that has not been done throughout the history of this world. He wants to have us as his people who are able to overcome the way Jesus overcame. But that will never happen unless we fall in love with Him. Amen. We can preach about it, we can talk about it, and 150 years later we're still preaching about it and talking about it. Why hasn't Jesus come? Have you ever heard of that word, the loud cry? Why hasn't the loud cry happened? Why hasn't that angel in Revelation who came down and touched the earth and the earth was filled with His glory. Why hasn't that happened? We're told in history that God wanted to do it over a century ago. And He brought our forefathers right to the door of the Promised Land. And He was willing to pour out His Spirit. But something happened and it didn't happen. Do you know what that was? One word, I heard it. What was it? Unbelief. Unbelief. What I see, what I see, is that if we were to fall in love with Jesus, and really fall in love with Him, the way Peter fell in love with Him, you think Peter loved Jesus before the cross? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Peter loved him so much that Peter promised him that all these can forsake you, but I will never forsake you. Did he believe that? Absolutely. Yes. 
Did he forsake him? Yes. John, the beloved disciple, did he love Jesus? Did he also say, I will never forsake you? No. Did he forsake him? No. No, they all fled. John followed from a distance, but it said, Jesus said, you will all be offended with me this night. It also tells you they all fled. So listen, this was before the cross. They loved him, but they didn't love him in a converted state. And we need to understand that because that's where we're at today. After the cross and after Jesus was raised and he met them on the beach, did he take Peter aside? And did he ask Peter, lovest thou me more than these? What did Peter answer him? Lord, you know that I love you. Did he ask him again? How many times did he ask him? How many times did Peter deny him? Peter, at that point, was converted. He had his heart broken. He was no longer trying to do the will of Christ in his own power. He was broken and allowed the power of God to come into him. Now listen, Jesus took him by himself and walked him down the beach and told him what the future was. And you didn't see Peter run away then, did you? You saw Peter accepted because Peter finally fell in love with Christ with his whole heart. And brothers and sisters, that is what you and I need to do today. Look, you know what it's like to love somebody. Heck, you may have loved 5, 6, 7, 10, 30 people. Right? I could say, Ray, I love you today and tomorrow. Ray, I don't like you no more. <laughs> we laugh at that, but do we not do the same with Jesus Christ? How can we say we love him and then not do what he says? Let's go back to our text. Jesus, move with compassion. I love that. It gives me such hope. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. Now, what I love about this the most is that Jesus did not ask them, how would you get leprosy in the first place? What sin did you do to get this dreaded disease? Jesus also didn't say, listen, dude, you've got to clean up your act before I do anything, and I'm definitely not touching you. But he, through faith, came to Jesus and realized that Jesus was his only hope and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me whole. And Jesus, moved with compassion, said, I am willing. And Jesus did something that was unheard of. He touched him. Touched him. Human touch. What's it like to have your daddy hug you? Doesn't it make you feel good? When things are bad and you hurt inside, and it feels like your world is falling apart, and your mom and your dad hug you, your wife embraces you, your children say, I love you. This is what Jesus did to this leper. I love you. I'm willing to come to you. I will give my life for you. Brother John, I right. just want to say that, that God always honors his faith statements. I mean, what greater faith statement than to fall before your knee before the Lord and say, if thou will, thou will make me whole. Amen. Verse 41, And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Amen. Turn to uh, chapter 5 of Mark. God, I told you I'd just stay in two books today. We'll probably go to three. Mark chapter 5. Let's look at verses 19 and 20.
You familiar with this story? This is where Jesus cast out the legion of demons from the man. The man now is sitting in his right mind. The people come and saw all the swine floating on top of the sea, and they asked Jesus, please leave. Leave before you destroy our whole economy. Please leave. And Jesus did what they said. But before he left, the man who he just got done taking this legion of demons out begged him, let me come with you. Let me come with you. And this is what Jesus said to him. This is Mark chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. However, oh well, let's go to 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had what? All you that are sitting here today, has God ever done anything for you? Has God had compassion on you? Do you go and tell your friends and your neighbors what great things God has done for you and what kind of compassion he's had on you? That's what we're here for. That is what is going to take a country like this who has fallen so far away from God and open their minds to the truth about Jesus Christ. When they see that we have something to say, when they see that God is working in us, that He's had compassion on us, and that we have compassion on them, and they'll turn to God. Amen. Turn to Mark chapter 6, one chapter over, verses 33 through 44. Mark chapter 6, verses 33 through 44. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came up, saw a great multitude and was moved with what? He was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Verse 36, what did the disciples say? Did the disciples have, compa have compassion on them? Got to love Jesus. Jesus had compassion on them. And he taught them. And he taught them throughout the day. Now it was late. And he realized that they'd be hungry. And they were in a deserted place with no place to buy food. And the disciples say, send them away so they can get food and feed themselves. What does Jesus say? You feed them. <laughs> you feed them. Verse 37. Uh, well, let's finish verse 36. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves some bread, for they have nothing to eat. Isn't that like us today? We see the need, but we have no idea how to meet that need, nor do we have the faith that God will actually use us to meet that need. Right? Don't you think this is what Jesus was looking for in them, in his disciples, in his followers? This was a great opportunity for them to express faith. This was a test. Did they pass it? Yeah. No. No, they failed. <laughs> they failed. They said, send them away and let them buy their own bread. And Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. And they were shocked. They looked at each other and they said, how are we going to feed all these people? Did they forget who was there with them? I can relate to them. I can relate to what they said. I can relate to that lack of faith. But I'm tired of relating to them. I want to be like they were after the cross, after the resurrection. Amen. Let's continue on. Verse 37. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. 
And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, <laughs> We got five loaves and two fishes. What are they among such great multitude? Where was their faith? Listen, could Jesus raise the dead? Yes. Could he calm the storm? Yes. Was there anything that was impossible for him to do? How did he do those things? Did he do it because he was God? Or did he do those things because he trusted in God? Yes. Listen, Jesus says, I do nothing of myself. And he never used his divine power, but he was submitted to the will of his Father. Amen. That everything he did, he did because this is what the Father told him. Amen. This is what the Father showed him. Is that right, Ricky? Amen. Now, have you ever thought about that? Because I had a conversation last week at lunchtime, and it helped me out tremendously. When it comes to Jesus Christ, and when I was a child and growing up in Catholicism, they taught me that I needed the intercession of Mary and the saints because Jesus was created so high that he could not know what it was like to be me, nor could he help me because he wasn't like me. And that's why I needed to go through Mary and all the saints. Because they had the same nature I did, except for Mary. Then I started reading scripture, and I read in Hebrews that my high priest knows what it's like to be tempted, just like me. Last week while I was sitting at lunch, I was told that Jesus had, had everything that I had that there was nothing different in his makeup and that he overcame the same way I can overcome. He trusted in his father and I am to trust in him. So his equipment is the same as mine, right? Now let me ask you a question. In Catholicism and throughout most of Protestantism today, they teach that Jesus came like the first Adam. Amen. That he came before he was born with the nature of Adam before the fall. Okay? And that he never fell, and so he was able to secure my salvation. Then I heard, once I joined this church, I heard a presentation on the nature of Christ. And it was the most beautiful presentation to this day that I've ever seen on the person of Jesus Christ. And it talked about his nature, what he was as a man, and what that means for me as a man, and what it means that he overcome, and he tells me to overcome as well. And what this brought out was that Jesus took the nature that I have, a fallen nature, that when he came, he took the nature of Adam after the fall. Yeah. And I thought about this. And I thought about this, and I thought I'd been thinking about this for years and years and years. And, and I've heard preachers within our own church say, no, Jesus couldn't have had a fallen nature, so he would have needed a savior himself. heard other preachers who grasped this and were able to see where this goes and, and how beautiful it is. But I thought about it. What I thought about was when the angel came to Mary and told her, you are going to have a child. And that this child is going to be the promised one, the holy one, the Messiah. When Jesus was born, and he actually, she had contractions, and she gave birth, was he just like every other baby? 
So, he had a mother, is that right? In, in, in the process of making this baby, you know how babies are born, right? Okay? Who was the father? The Holy Spirit. Didn't it say that the Holy Spirit would come upon her? Is Jesus both human and divine? Where did he get his divine nature from in the incarnation? Okay. Did he have a mother? Yes. And where did he get his human nature from? Now, doesn't that fit in with how you and I are born? Do we not get something from our fathers and something from our mothers? Now, see, remember, I was raised in Catholicism. And I was raised that Mary was born immaculate. Are we Catholics? Do we follow the teachings of Catholicism? So, through Mary, what kind of nature did Jesus inherit? Well, there's the answer to that question. It's not hard. So listen, Jesus had to be a high priest who was able to offer better sacrifices. And in coming and taking on a nature like me, he's able to offer better sacrifices. Meaning that he's able to, there's this word, S-U-C-C-O-R. What does that word mean or say? Yeah, that's an old, old English word. We looked at that last week. What does that mean? There's another word, guarantor. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Jesus is our guarantee. He's our guarantee for salvation. He's our guarantee for righteousness. He's our guarantee that God will not leave us like this, but that God promised us to make us into a new creation. Right? And Jesus is able to have compassion on me because he knows what it's like to be me. The difference is, I don't know what it's like to be him. The temptations that I face, and I know that they're great, are nothing compared to the temptations that he had to face. Amen. But did he fall? No. Did he fall by one thought? No. He who knew no sin became sin. That blows my mind. Listen. I tell you all this to bring you to the person of Jesus Christ. Fall in love with Him because there's no one better to fall in love with. Jesus will never cheat on you. He will never beat you. He will never lie to you. He will never steal from you. When we fall in love, isn't that what we want from the person who we fall in love with? We want to be able to be honest with them. We want to be able to be ourselves around them. We want to be better people. And we're hoping that they can do that for us. That's why I married my wife. Because I wanted to be a better person. And I thought that she could help me do that. And she did. But what I realized is that I needed God. <laughs> she realized that too. <laughs> we can only take each other so far. I'm saying what we need is a heart transplant. Amen. And only God can do that. This is what Jesus has done for me. Listen, I want you to think about this. Do you remember the day you became a Christian? Do you remember when you were converted? If you did that when you were a child, there's not a whole lot to look back on about your sinfulness. But if you were converted as a child and you've been walking with God all this time, think about how many times you've sinned against Him and you've hurt Him. Think about that. Think about that. Now what I want you to think about is that Jesus foresaw, foresaw that. Foresaw every 